Join us Friday at 12 noon and Sunday at 9 p.m. on Texas Public Radio. We are back. This is The Source on Texas Public Radio, 89.1 FM. I'm David Martin Davies. We now turn to the Democrats seeking the party nomination for House District Seat 116. Representative Diana Arevalo and challenger Trey Martinez-Fisher, who once held the office, he didn't run for re-election in 2016. Instead, he ran for a state Senate seat and came up short. I would like to take as many questions as we can from the public as possible. You can call in. The number is 210 614 980, and you can email us at the source at tpr.org. Tweet us at TPR Source, and also we're on <coughs> Facebook Live. You can go to our Facebook TPR Facebook wall. We'll take questions from there as well. But we are looking for questions on issues, not personal petty politics. And we need questions that are open to both candidates. Both can answer. And if we take your call and you start giving a speech or making accusations, we're going to have to cut you off. So uh, we're going to start off with opening comments, two minutes for each candidate. We flipped a coin earlier to see who goes first, and so and then we're going to go back and forth with the order. And Trey Martinez-Fisher, you get to go first. Uh, two minutes for you, sir. Well, thank you, David. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, my name is Trey Martinez-Fisher, and as many listeners know, I serve this House district with this distinction for 16 years. I was elected back in 2000 right out of the University of Texas School of Law when I had graduated, and I've served for 16 years in every session uh, I have been fortunate to have been distinguished for my work from my very first term where, you know, every member of the House, including Republicans, voted for me as the freshman Democrat of the year to my last three terms where Texas Monthly recognized my work back to back as one of the 10 best lawmakers in the state and the bull of the Brazos, which is a, for the most effective advocate. And, you know, I'm proud of that work because of the work that I've always done, bringing issues that this community has brought to me. Uh, some of the best pieces of legislation I passed was because folks, men and women, at the doorstep talked to me about things they cared about. For instance, when, when street racing was a phenomena here in the city of San Antonio and, and a Jefferson High School senior died in a car accident, uh, I passed a law for Jessica Santos to make street racing illegal. Uh, when Tom Deshant was a senior citizen who was a member of the San Antonio Crime Commission, when he told me about fly-by-night roofers that were scamming people out of their money and senior citizens had a hard time recouping uh, that economic loss, I passed a law for Tom that made an enhancement for anybody who commits a financial crime on a senior citizen. Uh, the work that I have done has always been tied to this community, and I've been very effective. But at the same time, you know, it's not just about passing laws in Austin. It's about stopping bad ideas, and I have stood up for this city Time and time again, whether it was defeating efforts to take away our tree ordinance, defeating efforts to, you know, mess with San Antonio's version of annexation policy, or even sanctuary cities, uh, I was there to stop it. And that's why I want to go back to Austin. All right. Now let's go to Representative Diana Arevalo. Thank you so much for having me, and thank you for hosting this candidate forum. I am proud to serve the constituents of House District 116 as the state representative. You know, a couple of years ago, I ran for office because my predecessor, who happens to be my opponent now, left for another opportunity that didn't come to fruition. I proudly served this district with honor and integrity in this past year, in my freshman term, even being named freshman of the year by the Texas, one of the caucuses within the Texas legislature. I'm very proud of that. I'm even proud of receiving the Patient Protector Award from the Texas Society of Anesthesiologists. I'm running for re-election because I want to represent the families, our community. When I go to the neighborhoods, I see people who I've known most of my life, my second grade teacher, my principal from school, my childhood friends and their parents, and I'm proud to represent our families in Austin, Texas as their legislator. I'm running for re-election to fight for the constituents of this district. All right, let's go to our first question. Also, I want to remind our listeners that our, uh, we'll take questions from you. Call in. The number is 210-614-8980, and we'll get you on air with your issue-oriented question. But for our first question here, and uh, Diane Arevalo, Representative Arevalo, you go first. 
So um, Rep- Senator Carlos Schiodeste, Democrats on trial for fraud. Testimony has not been favorable for him, but although the defense has yet to have their say, there's also been accusations about other inappropriate behavior for Yodeste and in Austin. Should Senator Yodeste resign, what does it say about the Democratic Party that there's been so much silence about this case as opposed to some of the noise that's been made about Attorney General Ken Paxton, who has had similar fraud charges? I know how difficult it is for survivors or anyone who has been sexually harassed or sexually assaulted, how hard it is for them to come forward. A few months ago, I took a stand by going public on television, on local newspapers, stating for any, anybody who has been a victim of sexual harassment, whether it was inside the Capitol, outside the Capitol, or even sexual assault, to feel free to utilize our office as a safe space. I don't support anybody's actions. I am on the side of all the victims of anyone who has been victimized or felt uh, victimized or have experienced anything like this. Too many women, especially in politics, are in the shadows on this issue, and they're terrified to come forward, rightfully so. There's so few women that are legislators. There's so few people that you can go and reach out to. I have made my office a safe space for any victim of sexual assault or even sexual harassment to come, we will get them the treatment that they need, whether it's counseling services, and help them also make the police report as well so they can get, they could follow the next steps so they can receive justice. But should Senator Carlos Chodeste resign? I believe any man who has hurt a woman in such a way should not be holding public office. So that's a yes? Yes. All right. Now, uh, Trey Martinez-Fisher, uh, you've worked with Carlos Chodeste over the years. Should he resign? Yes, and then the question you're speaking to is a broader concerning his fraud criminal case as well as allegations for his inappropriate behavior and unwanted advances on women. Uh, and, and, and clearly, uh, you know, those issues are not Republican or Democrat. They're not red or blue. They're right or wrong. Uh, and when they are wrong, people need to take responsibility for their actions. And it doesn't matter what party they're in. It doesn't matter they're your friends or colleagues. And so, listen, you know, Carlos is on trial for fraud. Uh, and there are two sides to a story. He's entitled to a defense, and that's what our Constitution is all about. But at the end of the day, he's also a public, a public servant. And in public service, you put your constituents' interests before yours. And, you know, Carlos has to take a hard look in the mirror and decide, you know, what does he want to be? Does he want to be on trial or he's entitled to a defense and the benefit of the doubt and the presumption of innocence? But he cannot hide behind his public office. Uh, you know, Carlos needs to do the right thing, and and maybe that does include him resigning as it relates to his inappropriate conduct. Uh, Diana's right. I mean, that should not be happening, period. Uh, unfortunately, in the Capitol, it, you know, there have been all too often too many stories. And, and one of the things that, that I've been working on, I've been working with, uh, you know, a local leader here in Pat Castillo, and we've been talking about things that we can do to address workplace harassment, including sexual harassment. And I've already drafted, for the very beginning days of the session, a housekeeping resolution that makes harassment training mandatory. It is unfortunate that today as we speak, every lawmaker, House and Senate, are not required to take harassment training. I now have a resolution that we can bring in the first two days of the session that would make it mandatory in the first 30 days. And if you didn't do it, you could be sanctioned by the House. And to clarify, you said he maybe should resign. Do you want to be? Well, no, I, I think that he should resign. Yes, okay. that's what I, I thought. What I thought I said. I'm sorry. All right. I just wanted to be clear. All right. So uh, now that you start off with this question, Trey Martinez Fisher, whoever holds the District 116 seat has an opportunity to be a leader in the Texas Democratic Party. And this is a party that is in ruins. Why can't the Democrats win a statewide seat? What would you do as a party leader to change that? Well, you know, it's a very good question. I mean, we're losing uh, races statewide, Democrats are, by about a million votes. The last time I looked at the data, the data suggests that there are three and a half million Hispanics alone that are eligible to vote and do not vote, or they are, or, or they are registered already, or they, excuse me, or they can be registered to vote and they do not register, or they're already registered, do not vote. If one-third of those Hispanics turned out across the state, we could win elections statewide. And the reason why that's so important, we just don't turn Texas blue. We change the Electoral College. And when Texas becomes ground zero for deciding presidential elections for the next several decades, 
people ought to recognize that. And so, look, it, it's not easy work. You have to go out and you've got to talk to people who are not voting. And that is a very hard job. Most candidates, most elected officials, they talk to people who are voting. We need to talk to voters who have disengaged from the process, find out how we can re-engage them and get them out to vote. I mean, I think that that is very critical. But it sounds like you're saying the reason Texas is not blue or the reason why the Democratic Party can't win a statewide race is because Latinos don't vote. Is that it? Well, I think that that's a very important constituency in, in the successful analysis, of course. Okay. Uh, Diana Arevalo, what's, that? what's up with the Democratic Party? And how can you be a leader? Well... Quite honestly, I'm very angered by the legislation that comes out when it deals with election law and voting. You know, in Texas, we have different opportunities that we could take and measures we could take, whether it's having the Secretary of State's office provide curriculum for students in middle school, elementary school, and high school, and teaching them exactly how to vote, especially those communities who may not be accustomed to. I know in Nevada, that is something that they do provide. Also, another item is making reg voter registration easier for young adults and explaining to them how important it is. Too often, they feel that their voice just doesn't matter. For me, I got involved in politics early on because of a personal issue that happened with our family, the Dome Dirt. And ever since then, I've been politically charged because of one key issue that touched home. And for many young adults, getting them engaged in the political process begins with registering to vote and explaining why it's so important. And then after they're taught, they will become engaged. But we also need to make voting a lot easier in Texas. Let's take Bear County, for example. On Election Day, we don't have super precincts. We can't just vote anywhere like we do in early voting. Until we have the funds for technology throughout the state where we can make voting easier for people and easily accessible, the numbers will increase. There have been pilot programs in certain counties where they've utilized mobile voting units, and the numbers increase tremendously. This is The Source on Texas Public Radio. We're talking to the two candidates running for District House District 116, Representative Diana Arevalo and also Trey Martinez-Fisher. Uh, we welcome your phone calls and your questions. The number is 210-614-8980, 210-614-8980. You can also check us out on Facebook. We're doing a Facebook Live event this afternoon. You can put your questions there as well, and we'll get them on the air. We'll be right back after this. Trinity Glen Rose District and the Gardening Volunteers of Texas present the Water Saver Landscape Design School. This workshop will cover new ideas to get rid of some grass and replace it with colorful drought-tolerant plants that attract birds and butterflies. This Saturday, February 10th from 8.30 a.m. to 1 p.m. Details at trinityglenrose.com. This nonprofit message is underwritten by the Trinity Glen Rose District. KSTX thanks the following business members for their financial support. Dr. Lewis Russell with Urology San Antonio. Pam Powell, Realtor with Remax Associates. Dr. Kristen Feibelkorn, Pathologist at UT Health Science Center. And Dr. Agnes Pallas of The Vision Source. Learn more about these business members at tpr.org. Support for TPR comes from Bin Tapas Bar, a new Jason Dady restaurant at 511 East Grayson, across from the Shuck Shack, featuring classic Spanish tapas and signature gin and tonic selections, inspired by Barcelona, Tuesday to Saturday, 4 p.m. to close. This is The Source on Texas Public Radio 89.1 FM. I'm David Martin Davies. We're going to be hosting a series of issues forums with candidates leading up to the 2018 midterm elections. Uh, early voting for the 2018 primary election starts in two weeks on February 20th. And uh, right now we're talking with the candidates, the Democrats, who are vying for the nomination from the Democratic Party, incumbent Diana Arevalo and also Trey Martinez-Fisher. You're welcome to the conversation. Ask a question to the candidates, to 210-614-8980, 210-614-8980, and uh, Romero has called in. And Romero, welcome to The Source. You're on the air. Thank you. Um, I wanted to just reiterate what uh, Representative Arevalo was talking about. My question is this. Okay. Um, with the influence of dark money and special interest money, I wanted to know uh, from both candidates who their largest contributor are contributors, and what, what, and who are they? 
All right, Romero, great question. And I'm sorry you're cutting in and out. Uh, that wasn't us. But uh, over to Diana Arevalo, Representative Arevalo. Who, who supports you financially? So the largest contributor on my campaign to date is Annie's List. I'm very grateful for the in-kind contributions that they've been able to provide, as well as their financial backing uh, for our block walking efforts, our phone banking efforts. But I'm also proud of my colleague, uh, Representative Garnett Coleman, who has also contributed. He's contributed $5,000 to date. I'm very proud to have his support. And one individual, Magdalena, who works for herself. Uh, she's written me a $2,500 check. So I'm very proud to have the support of those couple, those individuals as well as the support from Annie's List, a progressive group that supports women for running for office. All right, Trey Martinez-Fisher, uh, who supports you financially? Well, well, first let me make clear, I mean, uh, there are no instance or inferences of dark money uh, involved in my campaign. All of our campaign donations are posted online. In fact, there were reports that were posted yesterday with the Texas Ethics Commission. Uh, you know, I have a, a number of donors from all across the state. I've been in the office for 16 years, and will come to mind are members of the La Mantilla family that, that are in, you know, ranching. They're in oil and gas. They have a, uh, a beer distributorship uh, in South Texas. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Rusty Kelly, who's in government affairs in Austin and does work for the San Antonio Spurs, has done work for Charles Butt and HEB, uh, has done a lot of work for uh, business leaders here in San Antonio. Very proud to have his help. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've also been friends with, with local attorneys. Uh, you know, Pat Maloney Jr. has been a, a contributor to me here. He's a local attorney here in town, as well as others like Michael Watts. Okay, here's another question from a caller, and if you want to shoot in a question, the number is 210-614-8980, and Elisa has called in. And Elisa, welcome to The Source. Uh, you're on the air. Hi, I'm a big fan, and I'll take my the answers off air. Okay. Um, my question is probably a subject that's not very popular, but it's something to think about going um, along the path how it's difficult to vote. Um, and it's near and dear to my heart, but people who have a felony and who are out on probation are, are stripped of their rights to vote. This is a very big population, and we know most people who have been incarcerated or have been um, accused, I mean, who have been convicted of a crime are usually those who are disenfranchised, lower economic, low socioeconomic stat uh -huh. status. So your question. They can, they can be out on probation contributing to society, but they're not allowed to vote. Other states have allowed these people to vote. Would either of these candidates be um, in favor of supporting a law that would allow them to vote? All right. Thank you, Lisa. So go to Trey Martinez-Fisher first. Well, no, that, thanks for the question. It's a very good question. I mean, restoration of voting rights is very critical. Everybody has a role and a voice that they can play. And what's ironic is the state of Texas uses our prisoner population when it comes to redistricting. So in other words, uh, men and women that are in a Texas prison are counted for the purposes of, of uh, creating legislative districts, but they don't have the opportunity to vote. And so I think fair is fair. I think that individuals who take responsibility, uh, you know, for their crimes or allegations, uh, you know, should have the ability to participate in the government. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's a solid, you know, proposal that, that should be looked at, and I think it has a lot of merit. And over to Representative Diana Arevalo. When I first ran for office, I was very proud to have the support of the Second Chance Democrats who wanted to restore voting rights, especially to this population. But it's more than that. It's also about making sure that they're able to get jobs, uh, apartments, uh, be able to purchase homes in their name and make it a little bit easier, especially when they re-enter the workforce. I would love for, for them to have restore the right to go ahead and vote after they have served their sentence but also make it easier so they could have re-entry programs to work. And I do support initiatives such as banning the box. All right, here's a question, uh, and Diana Revelo, representative, you go first on this one. Uh, so District 116 covers Bandera Road uh, between Loop 410 and 1604. There's a heated debate about what to do about that road. Should there be a flyover connection that would speed up traffic flow, or but that would, some say, hurt the economic activity in that area? Uh, where do you stand? How are you going to make sure that those people who live in that corridor get a voice? Well, I know that uh, specific area uh, definitely is very important. I know part of Leon Valley is part of Justin Rodriguez's district. And then on another side of Evers Road is part of 116. 
not too long ago, actually the last weekend, the city of Leon Valley held a community forum and a community workshop about the issues that they face on Bandera Road. I'm very pr proud of the fact that our office has been actively engaged with that immediate community, and we support the initiatives that the local residents see on a daily basis. We wanted to make it easier for them to get inside their homes. I know there's also some drainage issues um, right near Bandera Road, which is along Evers Road, as well, that they face, especially when it rains really hard next to their library. So I, I know that right now there's many conversations happening, not just with TxDOT, not just with the city of Leon Valley, but I know our local councilwoman is also part of those conversations. Our office has been engaged in those conversations, as well as Representative Rodriguez. All right, uh, Trey Martinez Fisher. Well, um, when it comes to transportation, it's a all of the above strategy. I, I was in the legislature and was able to co-write a piece of legislation that created Two and a half billion dollars a year for transportation projects now. Two and a half billion dollars sounds like a lot, but it's not enough. And, and what it takes is it takes the, the constant input from community stakeholders. Let's come up with our priorities and let's go advocate for our share of those funds. I mean, truth be told, I mean, that area of the city is under chronic congestion. It doesn't just hurt the residents that are traveling to and from. It also hurts the local businesses. And not, the, and not to mention what it does to our environment when you have a bunch of cars sitting on a roadway just idling. Uh, and so, look, I, I think this. I think that we can come up with creative solutions. Let's be very clear. They're not going to be inexpensive. They will cost resources. And we have to make those tough choices and share those sacrifices. Back to the phone lines, 210-614-8980. Stuart is on the line. Hey, Stuart, welcome to The Source. You're on the air. Uh, thank you very much. If Hurricane Harvey had landed just 30 or 40 miles further to the west, it would have been San Antonio rather than Houston that would have had that great impact. I'd like to know, I think that uh, Texas can play a leadership role in uh, preparing for our future climate, and I'd like to know what legislative uh, proposals you might come forward with to address climate change. All right, Stuart, thank you for the call. Trey Martinez-Fisher, you're up. Two minutes. Great question. Uh, I served on the Natural Resources Committee, and which really deals mostly with water. And in a joint hearing with the Energy Committee, I was able to get our state climatologists to admit that drought conditions were effects of global warming. And, you know, while it sounds like common sense to you and I, it was an earth-shattering moment at the Capitol. It was the first time that there was an acknowledgement that our environment is impacted by global warming. And so, yes, I do believe we need to be smart and proactive of not just about using alternative fuels uh, to, to diversify our energy space. We also need to be thinking smarter about using renewables in our construction uh, process, in our planning, and our development process. That's why I've been such an ardent defender of the tree ordinance. We have lawmakers from East Texas trying to take away San Antonio's tree ordinance. I've been the person stopping it. I've been the person defeating those attempts to take that law away. And so I agree with you. We have to recognize that the environment plays a big role and that we are subject to the whims of Mother Nature, and we better get smart about it. And Representative Dion Diana Arevalo. Well, with respect to climate change, I think um, we can begin with strengthening some of the laws regarding T TCEQ. When you have a company who is Valero in our district saying that they even have issues with uh, the regulations, that they should be stricter, we have a problem, a fundamental problem that we need to be addressing. But with respect to Hurricane Harvey, there are countless other issues, along with climate change, that we have to address. One key issue that happened during our Hurricane Harvey is how are we getting people to safety? How are those individuals whose lives are supported through electronics, through machines, how are they going to get the services that they need, the dialysis, the medications? For too many people who left their homes during Hurricane Harvey, they couldn't even get their prescription drugs. By the time they went to a shelter, it was mush. So making sure that we, have, we are prepared so people can actually live their lives and get the treatment that they need. And since Hurricane Harvey, there has been a joint committee of public health and health and human services in Austin addressing the needs of Hurricane Harvey. And I look forward to more of those conversations and creating meaningful legislation that deals not just with climate change, but also public health as well. 
This is The Source on Texas Public Radio, 89.1 FM. We're talking to the candidates running for the Democratic nomination for Texas House District 116. We have incumbent uh, Representative Diana Arevalo and also Trey Martinez Fisher. Earlier we heard from Fernando Padron. He is the Republican candidate who is unchallenged in the primary. We're uh, also on Facebook Live if you want to see uh, the un. Information and that's not communicated through the airwaves. The the, the nonverbal information you can see what we look like, uh, and also we got some questions from Facebook. Uh, and this one is: What bills or other actionable projects are you excited about uh, getting passed? And Diana Arevalo, uh, you're up. Well, one of the items that I, I took up when I first got elected was public health. I was very eager to serve on this committee to the point of conducting a listening tour before I got into office and even afterwards. And before this campaign, we've been doing a listening tour dealing with health care issues. Some of the bills that I'm anxious to file deal with home health, deal with nursing home care, deal with our geriatric care. Our seniors are so valuable to all of us. And I know how important it is we want to take care of our loved ones, but we also need to make sure that we have laws in place to help them and help the quality of life that they are receiving. All right. And Trey Martinez Fisher. Well, I'll tell you what, every legislative session is always an adventure. But what concerns me the most uh, is the fact that we go into a legislative session with a negative account in the neighborhood of four and a half to five and a half billion dollars. In other words, that's how much money we owe before we can begin spending on the next two years priorities. The last time Texas faced that situation Public education was cut. $5.4 billion left the public education system. Now, I'm not, I'm not, I am not eager to go to the session to defend a budget, but when a budget's going to hurt children and educators and classrooms and parents and families, you know, I need to put my personal legislative agenda aside and stand up for those kids. Uh, That is a big concern of mine. And then on the other end of the spectrum, you have a governor who has now announced that he wants to put a two and a half percent spending cap on cities and school districts. In other words, preventing them from raising and spending the revenue they need to keep San Antonio a first class, triple A bond rated community. Uh, I've got to put my personal projects aside and I've got to stand up for one point three million San Antonians that rely on the city of San Antonio for their services and for a city that can provide and deliver. Uh, And these are going to be the two most important issues of the session. And I want to use my experience and my seniority to get on the committees where these conversations are taking place so that San Antonio can be represented. Got another question uh, from Facebook. This is from Portia. What specifically do you plan to do in office that's different from your opponent? And again, Trey Martinez-Fisher, you have two minutes. Well, it's a great question. Look, I, I you know, seniority matters in the legislature. So I, I go back to Austin. I, re, I regain my seniority. will probably be somewhere in the top 25 out of 150 members. That allows me to pick the committees that I want to be on. It doesn't matter that I'm a friend of the speaker or not. I get to pick those committees by seniority, and we just talked about the issues of the budget. We talked about the issues of of putting revenue caps on cities. Aside from that, aside from that, I want to be able to bring my years of experience organizing Democrats on the House floor to stop bad ideas. When I was in the legislature, I stopped sanctuary cities with my rule book. I used our strategy, and in some instances, David, that would I would stop the proceedings of the House for hours until we had a resolution. When it came to the San Antonio State Hospital being closed and losing our state-supported living center here in San Antonio, I stood up and stopped the proceedings until we took that off the chopping block. I think that that's what makes me a little bit different. My years of experience, my judgment, my ability to be strategic on the floor with proven results in the debate uh, distinguishes me from my opponent. Now, uh, incumbent Diana Arevalo, what distinguishes you from Trey Martinez-Fisher? Well, clearly I don't have the years of experience that he does in the legislature, but I'm definitely not new to politics and to community service. I see myself as a public servant, a leader for this community. The fundamental difference is I chose to be here, and I'm going to stay here because I care about the needs of the people that I see every single day. The key difference is constituent services and how we take care of the residents back home. Yes, legislation is important. Yes, it is important to speak up for our residents, our neighbors, our community, but it's equally important 
to be there and have an office that is open for the neighbors year round, not just during when it's politically convenient for them. It's important that they know that they have access to us throughout the year, that they can come, receive constituent services, and also have community events so they can have build trust with their, with their state representative. All right, we're going to take another break, and uh, our phone lines are still open. If you've got a question or a comment, call in. Just a question. <laughs> we just want one questions right now. These are questions that are issue-driven, issue questions that both candidates can answer. The number is 210-614-8980, 210-614-8980. The source continues after this quick break. Ballet San Antonio presents Red, a mixed repertory engagement, conjuring passion, love, humor, and strength by fusing classical ballet with contemporary dance at the Tobin Center for the Performing Arts on Friday, February 16th through Sunday, February 18th. Tickets and more details at tobincenter.org. This nonprofit message is underwritten by Ballet San Antonio. Despite a reputation for hot summers, there's plenty of interesting weather in the Lone Star State. Everything from ice storms to hurricanes and even the rare snowfall. At our next Think Science event, we'll hear from two experts about Texas's unique weather patterns and how predictions are made. Join us for Think Science Weather at the Pearl Studio on Friday, February 16th at noon. It's a free event and open to the public. Reserve your seat now at tpr.org. This is The Source on Texas Public Radio, 89.1 FM. I'm David Martin Davies. We're talking to the two Democrats who are fighting for the nomination to be on the November ballot for the Democratic Party for District 116, the House District. We've got the incumbent, Representative Diana Arevalo, and we have Trey Martinez-Fisher, who used to hold this office. And we've got you. You can call in, give us your questions, numbers 210-614-8980, like Leaf. And let's get Leaf on the air. Leaf, welcome to The Source. You're on the air. Hi. Hey. Uh, my, question, my question is a simple one. Uh, the school funding is really, really important, and and I am uh, concerned that that school funding could be in danger. I'd like to know what what uh, each of the candidates' plan is to protect, uh, preserve, and maybe even expand school funding, uh, and working with the uh, the other side of the aisle to make that happen. All right, appreciate that great call, and so let's go now to Trey Martinez Fisher. You have two minutes to talk about school funding and how you would preserve it. Well, good. That was a very good question. And like I said, I mean, that is one of the most important issues of the session for me. Uh, I have some experience in working on this. In, in my third term in 2005, when I learned that English as a second language textbooks were outdated and our children were being tested on materials that they didn't even have in their textbooks, I submitted a budget writer and received funding for $50 million for ESL students across the state. Uh, certainly, Republicans were in control during that time. I had to work with the other side. But I proved my point, and $50 million went into the school system so these children could have their instructional materials. And then fast forward in 2013, uh, when the legislature and the Republicans in charge took $5.4 billion out of our school system, they said we didn't have the money. And when I realized they were wrong, when we went back to work in 2013, I stood up on the 28th day of the session, the loneliest place in the Capitol, which is the back microphone where you engage in debate, And I asked Speaker Strauss when public education was going to become a priority. And I never stopped. And I made so much noise and I made so much argument that as a member who wasn't even on the budget committee, the Speaker of the House appointed me to a budget conference to be a final negotiator on a school budget or on a a state budget. And I did not budge until $3.93 billion went back into the school system. So what we have to do is we have to be tough. We have to be firm. And we have to pass simple things. Schools are being priced right now on a cost of education index that was written in 1991. We need to update that. Once we price schools properly, we know how much they cost and we can fund them. All right. Now, Representative Diana Arevalo, school funding. Well, first and foremost is we definitely need to change the funding formula. Additionally, we need to provide additional weight to bilingual education, provide funding for transportation for our school children, but also it's also about the state showing respect to our families. Look, we have money and the rainy day fund. We should be tapping into that fund to provide the adequate funding that all of our public school children need. But the state also has to show respect for our educators. 
the ones who take care of our children and our communities, the ones that teach them. And that's by making sure that we have laws where these that are passed, where teachers get reimbursed for school supplies that they pay out of their own personal pocket, where there is a cost of living increase for our teacher retirees. So the state can actually show them respect. But we need to start by changing the funding formula. All right. Another caller question, and this is Doug. And, Doug, welcome to The Source. You're on the air. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you for taking my call. Uh, this, this subject has to deal with uh, undocumented workers or illegal immigrants, whatever you want to call them. Uh, it seems like all or the majority of the action taken on by state legislatures and the federal government is focusing on the people who are trying to seek employment in the United States. And I don't blame them for trying to get a better job and making things better for their family. But to me, nothing seems to address uh, those who employ undocumented workers or illegal immigrants. And uh, I used to live in San Antonio, and now I live in several counties west of San Antonio. And there's been a year of tough talk about immigration. And I can tell you, quite honestly, that... Um, Undocumented workers are still widely employed. Okay, so tell me your question, Doug. So my question is, do you see the state uh, legislature doing anything to strengthen penalties with regards to those who employ uh, undocumented workers? All right, Doug. And let's go to Diana Arevalo, uh, representative of the incumbent. I'm being very angered that SB4 was passed um, this legislative session. When I hear a caller talking about undocumented workers, the image that comes to mind is my grandmother who immigrated to this country and just had the clothes on her back and a few dollars in her pocket. And she made it all the way to San Antonio. And all she ever wanted was a better life for herself. I know that we need to have a pathway to citizenship that's a much easier for all undocumented workers and for all immigrants. But the tone that is being set at the state level is wrong. It hurts our families. Right now, we have a political party, the Republican Party, that wants to build a wall between me and my family. What type of message is that sending to our community? When I think about these undocumented workers, I think of my grandmother. And I think of opportunities that these people are just trying to create, not just for themselves, but for their families, whether it's in Mexico or any other country. We need to make a pathway to citizenship much easier for them so they don't have to live in the shadows anymore. Trey Martinez Fisher, uh, your response to that. Doug, I'll answer your question. We don't agree on this issue. Uh, The state of Texas should not be in the immigration business. This is a federal issue. This is for the Trump administration and the Congress to come up with a comprehensive immigration reform. I'm heartened by my opponent's uh, position because it's inconsistent with her voting record. In fact, she voted for an e-verification process in the Railroad Commission Sunset Bill this last session. It was a second reading vote on a voice vote. Uh, It is in the journal. I don't agree with that. Uh, And so what I do believe is that we need a fix for immigration. We need dreamers in this state to have in-state tuition. I believe that the undocumented should have a driver's license because when they have car accidents, they don't have insurance. And they have accidents with people who do have driver's licenses and insurance, and their rates go up. We need to get smart about our immigration policy. We need to be compassionate. And we need to look at this issue from all vantage points, from a religious vantage point, from an economic vantage point, and from a social justice vantage point. All right, I'm going to give uh, Diana Revelo a chance to respond uh, to that. Uh, I know my opponent has brought this up before, but my vote was changed. All you have to do is look at the journal. My vote was changed. That was a, that was a vote that Representative Anchia put on the table, and that was the the – bill that he had put on the table dealing with E-Verify. That vote was changed. Okay. All right. So um, that seems like it's been clarified. Now let's go ahead and go another question. I'm going to ask you, uh, Trey Martinez-Fisher, first to sound off on, looks like property taxes is going to be a major issue in the general election. Uh, Governor Greg Abbott is uh, talking about trying to uh, cap property taxes. Uh, we got to pay for services and, and cities and all sorts of things. How is that going to work? Well, you know, I've been having this conversation already with Mayor Nuremberg. I mean, the, the, the bottom line is this. Uh, the governor wants to put a 2.5% cap on the amount of revenue that can come into a city year by year. And anything over that amount, 
he wants two-thirds of the electorate to vote for it, 66 percent. He wants to impose that same condition on school districts. And quite frankly, uh, we cannot keep up with the demand for the roads. The project we just talked about at Bandera and 410 will not happen under two and a half percent cap. We cannot provide, you know, raises to our employees. We cannot increase services, have libraries, better airports. We cannot do anything when you put a set of financial handcuffs on the city of San Antonio. Uh, we need to be prepared for this. Uh, this came up last session, and now this year's proposal is much worse than the last one. Uh, again, this would go through the Ways and Means Committee. This is a committee that I've served on for three terms. This is a committee where San Antonio is going to need a voice, and I want to be that voice to make sure that our interests are protected. All right, Diana Revolo, I'm sure you're hearing from your friends and neighbors about property taxes. What do you tell them? Well, I don't agree with the governor's plan at all. This is going to immediately affect, obviously, local control, but the first that I think that are going to be affected is our first responders, our fire and police. They need the funding to do their jobs on a daily basis. Okay. Um, anything else on that? Well, I, I mean, on this issue, I'm, I'm very angered by the governor's um, plans and his strategy. We need to stick with local control for our school districts, for our cities, and our smaller municipalities, especially in this district when we have Leon Valley and Balcony Heights. Okay, so we're going to go now to our closing statements. You get a minute to uh, talk about uh, who you are and remind listeners why they should vote for you in the primary election. And let's go first now to Diana Arevalo, uh, the incumbent representative. Well, I'd like to thank Texas Public Radio and The Source for hosting this candidate forum. I have enjoyed the opportunity of serving this community with such compassion and such integrity this past year as their legislator for House District 116. I'm running for re-election because I want to continue to fight for the constituents of this district, whether it's on issues of health care or even education or veterans issues. All their issues are my concerns. I'm proud to have been their voice throughout this past year, and I'm humbly asking for their vote one more time. And now, Trey Martinez-Fisher, you have a minute to uh, wrap up uh, the, the, your, this forum. Thank you. I, I, too, want to thank TPR and The Source for having us here. It's important to have these debates. I mean, make no mistake, the next legislative session is going to be one of the toughest ones that anyone has ever experienced, and I've been through eight of them. And what's going to happen in an environment of a very, you know, disjointed political narrative with a Trump White House and several people in Austin wanting to act just like him. I do believe that we do not have a speaker like Joe Strauss. We need somebody with a steady hand, with the experience and the judgment to walk into a room and make sure that we're going to have conversations like adults and fix problems. We're going into a budget cycle where we don't have any money, and the outlook doesn't look much better, but the needs are great. I've been through eight budgets. I know all the tricks. I know all the excuses. I'm asking voters to send experience back to Austin, and, and I would like to be their voice. And that was Trey Martinez-Fisher. We were also were speaking with Diana Arevalo. She's the incumbent candidate for Texas House District 116. Early voting for the Texas primary election is Tuesday, February 20th. Primary election day is March 6th. And right now you will see whoever wins those days. They'll go on the general election ballot on November the 6th. This is Texas Public Radio's The Source. I'm David Martin Davies. Thanks for tuning us in. This has been The Source on Texas Public Radio. The Source is produced by Kim Johnson, Jan Ross Piedad, and David Martin Davies. Production assistance is provided by me, Ruben Garcia. Support for The Source comes from the contributors to the Community Engagement Fund, including the Gladys and Ralph Lazarus Foundation. Tomorrow at noon on The Source, diabetes, obesity, maternal and infant mortality, health issues that are serious problems for San Antonio.